My name is Angie. I'm part of the leadership team here, and I'm just so grateful to see all your faces. Uh, we like to say here at Crossroads that you belong here, and I certainly hope that that is something that you feel, no matter whether you're joining us online from the comfort of your home or whether you're here with us in person. Whoever walks through these doors, we want you to feel a sense of belonging. We want you to feel a sense of welcome, and so I just greet you into that. If you're new with us, we would love to know you. We'd love to hear your story. And we've made that process very comfortable. You can do that through texting the word new to the number on the screen, 720-513-1933. And somebody on the other end of that line will get connected with you. Now, what we love to do on, at, on, at Crossroads on Sunday morning is start our day in celebration of what God is doing. And sometimes we have the immense joy of starting our day by witnessing and celebrating a baptism. It's a moment in a person's life where they get to reveal that they have chosen to follow Jesus as their Savior. And we have an important job to do as well. We get to come alongside them and celebrate with them. And so this morning we baptized a sweet young girl named Gabby. Would you join me in celebrating her baptism? Take a look. My name is Gabby. I am 23 years old. I am a nursing student. So I grew up in church with one of my best friends in this church. I grew up at Crossroads and when I was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension, it was really hard on my family and I and we kind of realized that there's things in life that you just can't get through without Jesus and without him guiding you through life. In my teen years, I kind of drifted away from Crossroads and I drifted away from the church and my relationship with Jesus just because of all of the hardships that I was dealing with as a teenager. Recently, I have been able to find my way back to the cross. I want to get baptized because although I grew up a Christian and I grew up in the church, I've sinned. You know, I have sinned myself and I have broken his heart and I have done done things to upset him and I guess I just want to be baptized because I want to re-give re him my love. My name is Gabby and I have accepted Jesus as my leader and savior. Gabby, as your pastor, it is such a privilege to be baptizing you today. So based on the testimony of your faith today, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. today as we praise our God who is so good. You ready?
to see you today, and man, what an exciting way to start off our service uh, together. Man, what a privilege it was for me to baptize uh, Gabby. I don't know if you saw in the video, but that girl was just full of emotion when she was going under the water, which made me have a hard time. I was having a hard time baptizing her and saying what I needed to say, just looking at her and all the emotion welling up. But man, we love baptism because baptism really is this public statement that when it comes to our lives, that we, have, that we have changed our minds about who Jesus is, our relationship to him, what he has done for us, the redemption that we need uh, in him. It is this beautiful union that we get to have with Jesus in his death and resurrection. But most importantly, celebration. It's celebration. That's what baptism is. It is, it is a time to celebrate uh, someone making their profession of faith uh, before all of us. And so it's exciting. And I would just say that if you're here today and you're either at the beginning of your journey, or maybe you've been, you know, walking in this faith thing for a long time with Jesus and you haven't got baptized, I would encourage you uh, to investigate what that looks like for you in your life. We try to make it as easy as we can here at Crossroads. Uh, we have that text line that Angie mentioned earlier, 720-513-1933. And if Gabby's story inspired you, or maybe just the way that God's working in your life is moving you towards this act of baptism, we'd love to have that conversation with you. We have Doug Schmidt. He's the guy who walks through and tries to make this as easy as possible. And so if you're interested in that, just text the word next uh, to that number and we will get in contact with you to help you walk through uh, this part of your faith journey. I also want to say to those of you who are new today, uh, welcome to Crossroads Church. My name is Matt Manning, and I get to serve as the senior pastor here at Crossroads. And today, we are wrapping up our uh, series that we've been calling Go. This is week three of a series where we've been looking at some of the most famous words that Jesus spoke uh, while he walked on this earth. He actually gave them uh, to his disciples after his resurrection. He has this conversation with his, his disciples out of Matthew chapter 28, and he says these words to him. He says, basically, believers, I want you to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize them. This is what we just saw today. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of this age. If you've been um, with us through the course of this series, then you'll know that the word that we've been focusing on is really probably the most important word in this, and it's the word go. Literally, it means in your going, that as you're living your life, as you're going through this world, we want you, or Jesus says, I want you to, to go, and I want you to make disciples. I want you to baptize people. I want you to teach them what it looks like to walk in my, to walk in my ways. And so this series is really about how, we, how do we live this mission that is given to the Big C Church? How do we take these words of Jesus seriously in our lives, this assignment that God has given us, and how do we live it out locally, globally, and individually? And so we've been moving through this funnel. So week one, we took the global perspective and said, what does it look like to live this mission, to go out into the world, to bring God's gospel, Jesus' gospel, to the nations, particularly to people who have not yet heard of the name of Jesus? Then last week we moved down the funnel and we looked at it locally and we said how do we live this out in the communities in which God has placed us here in Thornton and Westminster, Broomfield, Brighton, Fort Lupton, North Glen, Federal Heights. How do we, how do we live in this community and go and, and live this out in our lives? And so we answered that particularly as a church through the community center and today, today we're going to move down the funnel even deeper into our individual lives. Like what does it look like for us to actually live this out in the lives that we are, that we're living? You know, kind of the Monday through Saturday, you know, when we're not in church and singing and 
and learning what does it look like to live this out in the going of our lives. And so in order for us to do that today, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I'm going to invite you to take a few steps backwards in Matthew to Matthew chapter 22, all right? Matthew chapter 22. Now, when it comes to Matthew chapter 22, uh, these, this teaching of Jesus is, is equally famous as Matthew chapter 28. It gets its own headline as well. It's really, it, it gets its own name. We call it the Great Commandment. And today, if you are here and you've like never even been in church your entire life, you've probably heard these words from Jesus. This is how famous these words in Matthew chapter 22 are. Now, setting the stage for you, historically speaking, when Jesus speaks these words in Matthew chapter 22, what we're in is what we call Passion Week. It's Easter week. That at the end of the week, Jesus will experience the crucifixion. That's, that's kind of the setting in which we are in. That Jesus is just three days away from being arrested, beaten, and put to death by crucifixion. Now, based on like previous moments in Jesus' life, we know that he knows what's coming at the, end of the, at the end of the week. Like Jesus is not surprised as he's going through Passion Week of what he's going to experience on Friday. In fact, very much he knows that he's a dead man walking. And the truth be told that probably for many of us, we've walked through someone who had this kind of perspective on life. Someone who has maybe given a terminal diagnosis and knew that their, that their life was, was near ends. And what's fascinating about us humans is anytime we walk down a road where we know that something's coming to an end, specifically when we know that our life is coming to an end, that we oftentimes speak about the things that are most important, don't we? That when we realize that there are just few moments left, whether that be in a relationship or a few moments left in this world, we typically spend the time speaking about the things that are most significant in our lives because the reality is, is that we don't have time to waste on the insignificant, on the invaluable. So too is Jesus. Like this is where Jesus is at. And so on Sunday, Jesus comes walking into Jerusalem, come actually riding into Jerusalem, right? Riding on a donkey. And the people are, are there and they're waving palm branches. If you grew up in church, like go back to flannel graph, right? Like waving palm branches, declaring that the king has arrived, the king has arrived. From that point forward, Jesus during the Passion Week goes on an absolute tear. On Monday, he enters into the temples. He overturns the money changers, those who are taking advantage of the vulnerable, of those who have come to worship God. Monday night, he heads to Bethany, which is about a two and a half mile track to another city to take care of some business there. The next day, he returns with his disciples. They do this like devotion along the way into Jerusalem that deals with the fig tree. It's kind of a weird story. Then he gets to Jerusalem. He preaches not one message, not two messages, but three messages during the course of that day. And then after all of that takes place, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that is the religious leaders, decide, you know what? This is a good time to pick a fight with Jesus. And so they do. So they come up to Jesus, and first they ask him a question about taxes, and they're like, Jesus, you know, when it comes to your money, should we first give it to God or to Caesar? What do you think? They're trying to trap him with that question. Jesus doesn't fall for the bait. He works his way around it. They don't get him. Then they come back a little bit while. They ask him another question, this time about marriage, again trying to trap Jesus. He doesn't fall for it. He works his way around it. Then the third time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they go find this guy who's a lawyer, who's this expert in Old Testament law. And they say, hey, we're hatching this plan to trip Jesus up. Will you come with us? This lawyer is more than willing to come to him. And so the religious leaders of the day are in cahoots with this lawyer. The bait and switch is in play. And this lawyer walks up to Jesus and goes, hey, Jesus, like, I'm not sure that we ever met before. Let me introduce myself. I'm an expert in the Old Testament law. And I've just been thinking about, you know, my, my place of study. And you are an amazing teacher. You're an amazing rabbi. Maybe you can help me figure out the question that I'm pondering. Complete setup. He looks at Jesus in verse 36 and he says this. He says, teacher, rabbi, here's the question I've been thinking about. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus, you know that there's over 600 commandments that God has given to us in the Old Testament. What do you say? What's the preeminent one? What's the priority? What's the one thing that God wants us to focus on more than any other? If you could boil all of those 600 laws down to one and make it the primary one, what would you say it is? Jesus looks at this lawyer smiling, I imagine, and says in verse 37, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. Now, this is exactly what the religious leaders would have expected Jesus to say. That when it comes to all of the law, Jesus says, look, you can boil it down to the one thing. Make sure that you're loving God 
What was totally surprising for the religious leaders, in particular the lawyer, is that Jesus doesn't stop talking. He keeps going. And he says to them, verse 38, this is the great and first commandment, and the second is just like it, to which the religious leader would go, whoa, 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 whoa. We didn't ask for two. We only want one. And Jesus goes, yeah, I know, but I can't give you just one. i got to give you two. And the second is just like the first one. That is to say it's just as important as the first commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this, was, this is shocking for us, and maybe if we're a bit honest, this is even a little bit disturbing for us. Because when it comes to these two commandments that Jesus gives to us, the ones that he calls the greatest here, when it comes to this, if what's important to our lives is loving God with all of my heart, my soul, and my strength, then I like that, don't I? I like that first commandment, and particularly I like it because you can't quite check up on me with that one, can you? Like, that one, it's a little bit harder to see. It's a little bit harder to measure. Because the reality is, is, is you can't see my heart, can you? You can't see my soul. You can't see my mind. And me, like probably most of you, can, I can play a pretty good game. I can tell you that I'm praying, that I'm reading my Bible, that I go to church on Sunday. If it's about loving God, then man, I, I can play a pretty good game. I can be pretty good at that one. But when Jesus says that the second one is just as like it, just as important as the first, to love your neighbor as yourself, that one's tough. I mean, you can check up on that one, can't you? You can see that one. That one's visible. That one's measurable. That all throughout the New Testament, Jesus says that I hate to burst your bubble, but you can't have it going on with me and not have it going on with the people that God puts in your life. Because ultimately, the health and maturity of your relationship with God, at least according to Jesus right here, is measured by the health and maturity of the relationships of the people that God's put in your life. And so let's just be honest for a moment. That's a bit disturbing because I would rather have a religion, I would prefer a religion that was all about loving God and left everybody else out, moved everybody else out of the way. But when the question is asked of Jesus... Jesus, what's the greatest thing that we can take from the Old Testament? What's the greatest thing that's in the law? What is the primary thing that you want us to be about as a person, as, as, a, as Jesus is claiming to be God, right? Like, like, what's the greatest thing, Jesus says, loving God and loving others? Like, that's the main thing. That's the main thing. Loving God and loving others is the main thing. And Jesus looks out and says, look, don't you think for a minute, don't you dare think for a moment that there is a way for you to loophole, excuse, you know, make your way around, explain your way out of loving neighbors as yourself. In a different gospel, in the gospel of Luke, we're told this story and the lawyer goes on and he tries to do just that. He tries to loophole his way out of this. And so he looks at Jesus and he asks the question, well, well, Jesus, then who's my neighbor? Like, like, who are these people that I'm supposed to love as myself? Like, like help me understand that. And, and the really fascinating thing is when it comes to the Greek word neighbor, this isn't some, like, you know, general person somewhere out there in the entire world. That the word neighbor actually means those who are living in close proximity to you. It actually means those who are in your sphere of influence. You know, the families that your kids go to school with. The people that you share a cubicle with. The boys and the girls that you go and, and play sports with, the, the ones that you go drink with, not to mention your actual neighbors, which, by the way, only 3% of Christians in the United States can name their eight closest neighbors and something about them. See, when it comes to these words of, of Jesus, as we, as, we, as we look at these words of Jesus, I imagine that for most of us, unlike the religious leaders, unlike the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that we're not actually trying to loophole our way out of this, are we? Like, we're not trying to excuse our way out of doing these great commandments. In fact, we're a church that's built on the foundation that we treat the Bible like we believe it. Like, I doubt that the, you know, 350, 400 people that are sitting in this room right now, the multiple people are watching online, that you're not giving up an hour on a beautiful Sunday in Colorado to go, you know what, I've come here to sing and to listen to what Jesus has to say, and then, you know, I'm not going to do any of it. That's not why you come. That's not why you're a part of this that we want to do what Jesus says to do, the problem for us is that for many of us, we just don't know what that looks like. Like, we don't know what it actually looks like to apply these words of Jesus into our life. So fortunately, for those of us, my hand included, 
that ride, you know, front seat of the struggle bus on this one. But when it comes to the New Testament, the New Testament authors and writers wrote extensively about this subject. What does it look like to love God and to love others in your life? And one of the uh, prominent places that we find what it looks like to, to live these words out of Jesus is actually found in Romans chapter 15. In Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul writes these words, really as commentary, commentary to Matthew chapter 22. He says this. He says, let us, let each of us please his neighbor for his good. Mark, underline, highlight the word good. <laughs> to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures that we might have hope. That we are people of hope, Paul says. And that because of that hope, we have, we have this encouragement and this endurance to live in this world. And so as people of hope, verse 5, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony, mark, underline, highlights with one another. Going on. In accord with Jesus Christ. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome, mark, underline, highlights one another. As Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That these four or five verses here are just full of what does it look like to love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul says, well, let's just talk that through. He begins with, I want you to do good for your neighbors. That as you're living through this life, I want you to do good for your neighbors. I want you to consider their needs above your own. This is just an extension of what we looked at last week in Jeremiah chapter 29, where we discovered together that the calling of God's people is not just to pursue our own good, but actually to look out for the interest of others and to pursue others' goods as well as our good. That this is, this is Paul looking at all of the scriptures and saying that this is what it looks like to please your neighbor for his good. That you put your interest to the side and you make the priority your interest, the interest of your neighbors. Then he goes on and he says, I want you to, I want you to in your endurance, in your hope, as you walk as people of hope, that I want you to live in harmony with others. That you've been given a perspective that is eternal. That you realize that this world isn't everything. And so the peace that you've experienced with God, I want you to, experience, I want you to, to use that peace. And I want you to help your neighbors experience that kind of peace and that kind of harmony in their own lives. And Paul goes on. Then he says, look, and I want you to welcome the people that I've placed in your life. God says, I want, you to, I want you to be welcoming. That word welcoming means to accept. That I want you to accept the people that I'm putting in your life, which is huge because I know what I looked like when I came to Christ. He ties it to Jesus. He says, I want you to welcome the people in your life the way that Jesus has welcomed you into his life. And for me, I know that I was at my worst, at my absolute worst, when Jesus accepted me into his life. All of this just so full of what it looks like to love your neighbor as yourself. But really, this is all just the lead-in to where Paul really wants to get us. Verse 8. He says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant. That is, he became lowly to the circumcised, that's the Jews, to show God's truthfulness, that is, all of the Old Testament, that you might see it, that you might understand it, that you might see it as true in reality in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, it's Abraham, Moses, David, so on and so forth, so that, in order that, that the Gentiles, that is the nation, that's the world, might glorify God for his mercy. All right, this verse is so monumental in helping us understand what it looks like to love God and to love others. Like, this verse is so paramount in, in understanding why Jesus said, I can't just give you one, I got to give you two. It's so huge in helping us understand that Jesus looked at it and said, look, you, don't, you can't have it going on with God and not have it going on with the people that God puts in your life. So to give us a little context of, of why this is so huge, if you're following along, go back a few chapters to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Paul writes these words in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. He says this. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies, there's our word again, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves, uh, your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual 
worship. He goes on in verse 2. He says, I don't want you to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. If you've ever wondered, what is the will of God? What does the will of God look like? What's the purpose of my life? Why do I exist? Paul says, understand this, and you'll understand those questions. That you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect before him. Now, as you're reading these verses in chapter 12, the most important word to focus on here is the word therefore. Because when you use the word therefore, it means whatever follows, whatever comes after is being built upon something. And what Paul is building for us here is that he's helping us move from, from doctrine to practicality, from theology to ethics, to how we see and know God, to the way that that lives it out in our lives, to, the, to taking it from the foundation in which our lives are built on as believers in Christian, to what does it actually mean to apply this to our lives. That's what's happening here. So in the letter of Romans, just kind of a quick overview, so we're all on the same page here, that Romans has 16 chapters, all right? The letter written to the Romans is 16 chapters long, and for the first 11 chapters, it is all theology. Every single bit of it is theology, that Paul talks about God's wrath, God's judgment, God's righteousness, the fall, sin, death, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit into our lives, how God keeps us, uh, how he sanctifies us. He, he, does, he does it in terms of what does it look like for God to be sovereign, like all of these deep and theological, um, you know, just, just deeply rich ideas and understandings about who God is, all of it given to us so that we would be able to see God clearly, understand why this universe exists, and understanding why we exist in the universe. That he builds this beautiful worldview around Christ's death and ultimately his resurrection so that we would see clearly that when it comes to the Christian life, when it comes to the Christian life, that we exist in order to love God and in our love of him, display to the world what he is, his attributes, his characteristics, his greatness. And so Paul, in chapter 12, makes this transition after giving us this beautiful worldview. He uses the word therefore, and in doing so, he says, therefore, I appeal to you, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. Like this is Paul's shorthand for helping us understand that chapters 1 through 11, if there's one characteristic, if there's one attribute, if there's one thing that we should pay attention, that the entire world should know about God, it's that he is a merciful God. In other words, everything Paul says up until this point that I've shared with you in the first 11 chapters is that you would see that the God that you serve, the God that you worship is a merciful God. And so on the basis of that mercy... On the basis of, of God's compassion, everything else in Romans chapters 12 through 16 begin to unfold. And so by the time we get to Romans chapter 15, Paul says, here's the purpose of life. Here's why you exist in the universe. Look at it again through those eyes, verse 8. For I tell you that Christ became a servant. He did what he did not have to do. That the God of the universe, the creator, steps off the throne and enters into the creation. He makes himself lowly, humble, a servant. Why? In order that he might come to the Jews to show that all of the Old Testament is true and trustworthy, that you can put your life, you can build your life on this. To show that all the promises given to the, to the you know, to the fathers of the faith, that, that you can trust this, this is true, this is real. So that in order, in order, next verse, verse 9, in order that the Gentiles, that's the world, that's us, the nations, might glorify God for his mercy. That the nations might glorify God for his mercy. Like, get this, that Jesus came as a servant, as a servant. That the purpose of God sending his son into this world is so that you and I, that the nations might be amazed at his mercy. Like, if you're sitting here today wondering, what is my purpose in this life? Why do I exist in the universe? At least according to the Bible, it's this, that you exist to make people who are living in your sphere of influence, that you exist to make them amazed at the mercies of God. That your entire life is wrapped around the compassion of God. That you can stop wondering about what your purpose is. And start living in such a way that as people look at you in your life, that the only thing they can do is step back and go, yeah. 
that dude's God, he's merciful. That you live in such a way that you communicate time and time again that God treats you better than you deserve, better than you ever deserve to the point where people look and go, man, your God is a merciful God. I mean, everything that we've experienced as believers, at least according to Paul in Romans 1 through 11, everything that we've experienced is so that we would understand the mercy of God and in understanding the mercy of God that we would come to love God and out of that love to God, we would then take this mercy that he's shown to us and begin to live it into the world with the people that he puts in our lives. Like Paul looks at us and he goes, this is what it means to love God and to love others as yourself. To understand the mercy of God. To realize that God treats you better than you deserve. And when you begin to treat better, people better than they deserve, that people don't look to you. They look to your God. And so Paul says, so when we go out with our neighbors... We put their best interests in mind because that's what Jesus did for each and every one of us. That in his compassion, he put our good above his own. That's how he ended up at the cross. And when it comes to walking with the people in this world, he says, I want you to walk with harmony. I want you to walk with peace because that's what God has done for you. He's, he's just inundated your life with peace. And when it comes to bringing people into your life, I want you to welcome them. I want you to accept them with open arms because that's what Christ did for you. That in your worst, that Christ came to you and he showed you mercy and compassion. According to Paul, this is what it looks like to apply the words of Jesus in a, in a practical sense in your life. That as we go about demonstrating our love for God, we also love others. That mercy, mercy is the goal of life. It was the goal of Israel. It is the goal of Christianity. It is the goal of God that the nations would raise up and they would praise God for his mercy. And so at Crossroads Church, the way that we deploy this is through something that we call neighboring. Now, I know what you're thinking. Like, you guys aren't very creative when you name stuff. We're not, all right? It's just neighboring. This is what we do. And neighboring is the vision of, of how we in our going, just like our missions program, just like our community center, like how do we in our going love people in our sphere of influence by making them amazed at the mercy of God? The way we live it out is called 3D. It's the acronym that we use. It's 3D. And the first D is this, is that you discover God's story and your story. You discover God's story or my story. That you come to a place where you learn that the heartbeat of God so that we are inspired to have the same heartbeat for our neighbors. It's why we do our discipleship. It's, it's why we gather on Sundays and open up the, God, the word of God. So that we would be, so that we would know the story of God throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. So that we could see the characteristics of God. So that we could see that God is indeed a God of mercy. That's who God is, that he's a God of mercy. And in knowing how all of this takes place, then we begin to see how our own story intersects and webs together with God's story. Like how we're a part of the bigger picture that God has going on in our lives. That is the reason for some of you, if you've been in community groups, maybe you've noticed that when we go through our community group questions, the first half of the questions are really designed for you to dig deep and to know who God is. And then the second half of the questions always lead you out. What does this look like to apply to people in your lives? What does it look like to apply to your neighbors, to your sphere of influence? That everything that we do is intentionally designed for you to know God's story and how your story plays in that so that you can love others in your life. The second D is this, is that we display the gospel. And primarily we display the gospel through acts of service and building friendships in your current sphere of influence. This is where we encourage ourselves and each other to move from, you know, that initial, uh, you know, the initial meeting of one another to acquaintances, eventually to friendship. And that primarily in life, we do this through acts of service with the people that God puts in our lives. In the Manning family, whenever we have someone who is new in our, in our sphere of influence, in our block, we deliver cookies to them. Just a small act of kindness. Welcome. Welcome to the neighborhood. It moves to, you know, a point where maybe the carpet cleaners come by before they're moving in and they ask to use our water and we say, yeah, go ahead, clean the entire house. 
Eventually it gets to the point of, of acquaintance and friendship to, you know, where a neighbor just a few months ago came over and said, Matt, will you, will you proctor a test for me for work? I need to have someone like oversight with this. Of course, yes, I would. Acts of service that ultimately lead to friendship building. Now, when it comes to this, when it comes to this, this can happen over coffee and lunches and shared, inf- uh, shared interests, right? It can happen around holidays, invitations that begin in the front yard and eventually begin in the backyard over barbecue. And then we get to the third D, and the third D is to draw into invitation and into community, where you're investing in these relationships that you might invite them into the greatest thing about you, which is God's mercy in your life. That what we do here at Crossroads is we want to intentionally peep, uh, intentionally invite our neighbors into the greatest thing about us. And as a church, we're doing everything that we can to make that as easy and as simple as you can have here, all right? So, like, as you go through your life, just know that the things that we're doing is an intentional. So, you know, about every four to six weeks, maybe you've noticed that we throw a party here. We call them patio parties. Sometimes they're in the lobby. Sometimes they're outside. But we throw these parties. Here's the secret. They're only kind of for you, all right? That the reasons that we do, you know, Halloween parties and Easter egg hunts and on Father's Day, we're giving a car away to every guy who comes, all right? A Hot Wheel. But we're giving them all away, all right? The reason we do all that is so that when you're inviting friends in the people in your sphere of influence into this church, you're not just inviting them into a service where we sing and learn from God's word, but you're also inviting them into the greater community of the church. This is what it looks like to be family, This is what it looks like to to hang out with one another, to enjoy one another. It's the purpose of the patio parties. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, sermon series, that a couple of times a year, we put together sermon series specifically so that you can invite people who are in your sphere of influence into what we're doing here, things that we think that they would be excited to know about. So the next series that's going to happen like that is He Gets Us. It starts next week that you've maybe seen that he gets his ads all over TV on the Super Bowl. It's created a lot of conversation around our world. People are asking, is it good? Is it bad? Is Jesus really for us? Well, we want to actually ride that train, and we're going to do a four-week series on he gets us. Here's the news for you. It ain't for you. Hopefully, if you're a believer, you already know that Jesus gets you. The whole series is designed for you to be able to invite someone in your life, in your sphere of influence, to go, hey, look, I want you to hear about the person who's most important in my life. His name is Jesus And he gets us. He gets you. He knows what you're going through. See, all that we do is designed to draw people into this invitation, into this community where we can share the greatest thing about any one of us. That is, that is the mercy of God in our lives. And so today, as you leave and go into the lobby, if you're here in-house, we want to create opportunities for you and give you tools that make any one of these steps an easier step for you to take. And so out in the lobby today, we have these these Crossroads koozies that we came up. Crossroads on the front side, you belong here on the back. And here's the deal today. When you go out, you can grab a koozie, and one is for you, all right? So you get one, but if you get one, you got to give one, all right? So the one that you get is going to be empty. You're going to put it in your pocket. The one that you're going to give, you're going to go find a Coke, right? And you're going to put it in your koozie, and then you're going to deliver your koozie with a smile to a neighbor. And it's an easy tool to to make an invite to let people know that they do indeed belong here. Now, if you're not a Coke drinker and you want to put a Pepsi in it, that's fine. We're just not giving it to you, all right? In fact, Pastor Trevor told me that he was taking his koozie, taking the Coke out and putting other beverages in to hand out to his neighbor, all right? You can do whatever you want. But it's the easy tool to go out and to invite someone into the greatest thing about you. I was out in the lobby today. It is a party. We got all kinds of stuff. We have hot sauces and barbecue sauces and bags, everything really to help you when it comes to making an invite for people in your life, all right? With that said, can we pray? Father, we, uh, we come to you, and uh, Lord, honestly speaking, we want to be about what you said we should be about. And so, Lord, I pray that, that we love you well, that when it comes to our hearts and our minds, our soul, Lord, that we would understand your mercy, that it would wash over us, that it would change us, that we would move in such a way because of your mercy, that we would understand the compassion that you have shown upon us. And in that compassion, Lord, that we would go to others, the people that you've placed in our sphere of influence, or the people that might not look like us, the people who might not behave like us, the people who don't believe like us, 
Lord, that those people that you bring into our lives, Lord, that, that each and every day that we would take the opportunity through the demonstration of our lives for them to be in awe, in awe of the mercy of God. And so God, I pray that you would forgive us for the times that we look a lot more like an instrument of judgment than the voice piece of mercy. Father, I pray for those today who maybe have never experienced your mercy, who have never experienced your compassion and your love. God, I pray that that you would speak to their hearts today and that they would realize that everything, including up to including them sitting in this place today, is an act of your mercy. And that in their mercy, Lord, that they would trust and believe in you. That they would know that you came as a servant to the Jews to show us that all the promises, all the scriptures of the Old Testament are true so that we might, so that they might believe. God, we thank you for the way that you work in us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. If you're here today and want to have a conversation about what it looks like to draw near to Jesus, maybe you have some questions. We'd love to have that conversation. You can just text the name of Jesus to that text number, and we'll connect with you this week. As a family, we come together, and we participate in communion, reminding ourselves of the incredible mercy that God has shown to us. That when Jesus stepped into this world, with the express purpose of, of heading and going to the cross in order that his body might be broken so that those who are sinful, us, might be made clean before him, we realize the depth of his compassion. And so today we remember by eating the bread. And as his blood was poured out, we realize that in his compassion, the forgiveness is offered to each and every one of it. And so today we drink as a church, as a family, our salvation. I'm gonna invite everybody in house to go ahead and stand. We're gonna sing of the great mercies of God. During this time, if you'd like prayer, we'd love to pray for you online. You can click the button in house. You can make your way over uh, to the sign and we will lift you up in prayer together. Mandy, let's sing. As we continue in our time of worship, um, I was just reminded, hearing Matt's words, so my husband Will and I are, are expecting our first baby here pretty soon. Guys, we are so excited. Thank you. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see his little face. He's coming early April, and one of my husband and I, our most passionate prayer for him is that he would know and love God, yeah. and that from that love, that that would pour out in his life in all areas with everyone that he comes in contact with, um, whatever he chooses to do, whatever he loves, um, that it would be grounded in the love of God. And a big part of my heart as well is that we would, as my husband and I, we would be able to model that for him, that we would be able to lean into the love of God and that would pour out of us into our son. So I just wanna invite you guys today to just lean into the love of God, to celebrate the fact that his mercies are new every day that he is passionate about pursuing you and wanting you so let's lean in as we sing together today Close like no one. 
build my hope about to break. I will cling to your unchanging grace. Let the waters come in the earth in way. I'll be dancing in the rain. My feet are on the rock. I can see the morning light. Joy under the Here my faith is found I stand on solid ground And I feel my hope about to break I will be to your unchanging grace Let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain I stand all of the ground is sinking sand. So stop your feet and clap your hands. I feet are on the rock. On Christ's solid rock, I stand all of the ground is sinking sand. So stop your feet and clap your hands. I feet are on the rock. Come on. On Christ's solid rock, I stand all of the ground is sinking sand. So stop your feet and clap your hands. I feet are on the rock. And I feel my hope about to break. so excited to be here with you. You know, I wanted to take a few moments just to share with you why Crossroads is family to me. For me, that is found in my community group. These are the people that I am doing real life with all of the time. Through thick and thin, in joy and in sorrow, they are my people. I get to be real with them, and at the end of it, I get to thrive because they're there supporting me. If you're new at Crossroads, you're wondering more about what Crossroads is about, please text NEW to the number on the screen. Somebody will be able to connect with you and give you more information. Maybe you've been here for a little while and you're wondering about Crossroads and their community groups or ways to serve. Text the, new, the word NEXT to the number on the screen. And again, somebody will get with you to take those next steps. Finally, at the heart of why we thrive is because of Jesus. We love him and he loves us. So if you're wondering about a relationship with Jesus and you're ready to take it deeper, text the word Jesus to that number on the screen where a real life person is gonna get connected with you and share with you how to thrive in him. Thank you so much, Renee, for sharing that. Now, if you consider Crossroads Church your spiritual home, we would love to invite you into a partnership of generosity with us. And we've made that process simple as well. You can give your gifts as you leave, and if you're in the building with us, in the back kiosk in the back of the room, you can also download the app or check out our website. Either of those places are great places to give. I love to share stories of our generosity here at Crossroads, and so I was thinking about a neighboring generosity, and actually, I think this is a really good example. If you remember at Christmas, we handed out ornaments. We did the same thing where we asked you to invite your neighbor into Christmas Eve and you guys we gave out over a thousand ornaments and so we're asking you the same thing we're asking we're inviting you into this space where you can take this coke and a koozie and invite somebody in your world into Easter invite them into the community that you love and experience here at Crossroads what a great example of our generosity we thank you Crossroads for that last I'd like to just pray a blessing over you so if you'd like to outstretch your arms Go therefore and make disciples of all of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. You all have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next week. Happy Sunday. See you guys next time. Two.